The Book of Jude, verse 1. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. So the name is literally Judas, but to avoid connection with Judas Iscariot, the infamous man who betrayed Jesus, most English translators have used the name Jude to make the difference. And there are six people named Judas that it's mentioned in the New Testament, but the best evidence identifies this as the one that's mentioned in Matthew 13, verse 55, where it says, Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? In Mark chapter 6, verse 3, for the same thing. And so Jude is the half-brother of Jesus. <clears throat> and so Jude, like the other half-brothers of Jesus, including James, did not believe in Jesus as the Messiah until after the resurrection of Jesus in John 7 verse 5, where it says, For even his brothers did not believe in him. In Acts 1 verse 14, where it says, These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication, with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. And so Jude was a blood relative of Jesus, but he considered himself only as a bondservant of Jesus Christ. The fact that he wanted himself to be known this way instead of introducing himself as Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, is going to tell us something about the humility of Jude and the relative unimportance of being connected to Jesus by human relationships. And Jesus spoke of this relative un unimportance in passages such as Mark 3, verse 31 through 35, where he says, Then his brothers and his mother came, and standing outside they sent to him, calling him. And a multitude was sitting around him, and they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. But he answered them, saying, who is my mother and my brothers? And he looked around in a circle at those who sat about him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. So whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. And so Luke 11 verse 27 and 28 will say, And it happened as he spoke these things that a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast which nursed you. But he said, More than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. So without a doubt, Jude valued the fact that Jesus was his half-brother and that he grew up in the same household as Jesus, but even more valuable to him was his new relationship with Jesus. To Jude, the blood of the cross that saved him was far more important than the family blood in his veins that related him to Jesus. Jude could say with Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 or 16, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. So... James was an important leader of the church in Jerusalem and the author of the New Testament letter that bears his name. Both James and Jude were half-brothers of Jesus. And Jude wrote to Christians, to those who are called. This is not an evangelistic tract, and it deals with things that believers need to hear, but often don't want to. And Jude's going to identify his readers as Christians in three specific ways. They are called. A uh, person is a Christian because God has called him. The important thing is to answer the call when it comes, just as we answer the telephone when, it, when it's ringing. And they were sanctified by God the Father. This means that they were set apart, set apart from the world and set apart unto God. And they were preserved in Jesus. Jesus Christ is our guardian and our protector. Verse 2, mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. So this is not the same greeting as found in most of Paul's letters, which usually begin with some variation of grace and peace unto you. Yet it is substantially the same. And be multiplied to you. So in the mind and heart of Jude, it wasn't enough to have mercy, peace, and love added to the life of the Christian. He looked for multiplication instead of simple addition. Verse 3. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. So Jude's initial desire was to write about our common salvation, but something happened. Jude found it necessary to write a different letter. We might say that this was the letter that didn't want to be written, and the letter of Jude is essentially a sermon. So in it, Jude preached against the dangerous practices and doctrines that put the gospel of Jesus Christ in peril. These were serious issues, and Jude dealt with them seriously. <clears throat> and we should be happy that Jude was sensitive to the Holy Spirit here. Uh, what might have only been a letter from a Christian leader to a particular church instead became a precious instrument inspired by the Holy Spirit and valuable as a warning in these last days.
So our, our salvation isn't common in the sense that it's cheap or that everyone has it. It's common in the sense that we're all saved in common, in community. So God doesn't have one way for the rich and another way for the poor, or one way for the good and another way for the bad. We all come to God the same way. If it isn't a common salvation, then it's not God's salvation, and it's not salvation at all. So an individual Christian may not know it, understand it, or benefit by it, but to be a Christian is to be part of a community. To be a Christian means you stand shoulder to shoulder with millions of Christians who have gone before, and we stand with strong Christians and weak Christians, brave and cowardly Christians, old and young Christians. We are part of an invisible, mighty army that spans back through the generations. And so, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, and this was the great need that Jude interrupted his intended letter to address. The ancient Greek word translated contend comes from the athletic world, from the wrestling mat. It is a strengthened form of the word meaning to agonize. Therefore, contend speaks of hard and diligent work. And the verb translated contend earnestly is in the grammar of the ancient Greek in the present infinitive, showing that the Christian struggle is continuous. And we contend earnestly for the faith because it is valuable. If you walk into an art gallery and there is no guards or some sort of security system, then you must draw one conclusion. There is nothing very valuable in that art gallery. Valuables are protected. Worthless things are not. So if we emphasize the word you, we see that this was something that Jude wanted each individual Christian to do. There are many ways that every Christian can contend earnestly for the faith. And we contend for the faith in a positive sense when we give an unflinching witness, uh, distribute tracts, make possible the training of faithful ambassadors for Jesus, or when we strengthen the hands of faithful pastors who honor the word of God in their pulpits. And these are a few among many ways that we can contend earnestly for the faith in a positive sense. And we contend for the faith in a negative way when we withhold support and encouragement from false teachers. And we contend for the faith in a practical sense when we live uncompromising Christian lives and give credit to the Lord who changed us. So obviously, faithful missionaries and evangelists contend earnestly for the faith, but so does the Sunday school teacher or the home group leaders who is faithful to the scriptures. People like this contend for the faith just as much as the frontline missionary does. And each one of us should contend for the gospel wherever God puts us. And so contend earnestly for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. So here Jude is telling us that we are content what we're contending for. There is a lot of earnest contention in the world, but usually not for the right things. The faith once for all delivered to the saints is something worth contending for. The faith doesn't mean our own personal belief or faith in the sense of our trust in God. The phrase, the faith, means the essential truths of the gospel that all Christians hold in common. The faith is used in this sense repeatedly in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 6 verse 7, Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. It's in also in Acts 13, verse 8, 14, verse 22, 16, verse 5, 24, verse 24. Romans chapter 1, verse 5 will say, Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. And Romans 16, verse 26, But now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith. So Colossians chapter 2 verse 7 and 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 2 are just some of those examples. <clears throat> 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 2, to Timothy, a true son in the faith. And so we must contend earnestly for the truth. The faith is the body of truth that the very early in the church history took on a definite form. In Acts 2 verse 42, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Romans 6 verse 17, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. In Galatians chapter 1 verse 23, But they were hearing only. He who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. And so once is going to mean that the faith was delivered one time. It doesn't need to be delivered again. And of course, we distribute this truth again and again, but it was delivered by God to the world through the apostles and the prophets once. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. 
having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So God may speak today, but never in the authoritative way that he spoke through the first apostles and prophets as recorded in the New Testament. There is no other gospel. There will be none. Its con- content will be more fully understood, its implications will be developed, its predictions will be fulfilled, but it will never be supplemented or succeeded or supplanted. And for all means that this faith is for everybody, we don't have the option to simply make up our own faith and still be true to God. This, is, this faith is for all, but today it isn't popular to really believe in the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Instead, most people want to believe in the faith that they make up as they go along and and they decide what's right for them. More people believe in the faith that is in my heart than the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Verse 4, For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, in part... This is what makes them so dangerous. They are unnoticed. No one noticed that they were dangerous. They didn't wear a danger false teacher name tag. These certain men probably came, uh, claimed to be more biblical than ever anybody else was. And I see a lot of people going around today, pastors that are claiming to be apostles and prophets, saying that the God is speaking to them. <clears throat> and it's crazy how people gobble that kind of stuff up. And so... These certain men have a destiny, the destiny of every false teacher and leader. They are marked and destined for this condemnation, and it's enough to say that they are ungodly men. They are ungodly simply in the sense that they are not like God, and no matter the outward appearances, they disregard God. And they were unnoticed by men, but not by God. The Lord is not wringing his hands in heaven, worrying about those who deceive others through their teaching and through their lifestyles. They may be hidden to some believers, but as far as God is concerned... Their condemnation was marked out long ago. Their judgment is assured. The truth will win out, and our responsibility is to be on the side with the truth. And these certain men had received something of the grace of God, but when they received it, they turned it into an excuse for their lewdness. The idea behind the ancient word lewdness is sin, that is pronounced, uh, that it's practiced without shame, without any sense of conscience or decency. Usually the word is used in the sense of sensual sins, such as sexual immorality, but it can also be used in the sense of a brazen anti-biblical teaching, when the truth is denied and lies are taught without shame. And Jude probably had both ideas in mind here, because as the rest of the letter will develop, these certain men had both moral problems and doctrinal problems. And these words of Jude show that there is a danger in preaching grace, There are some who may take the truth of God's grace and turn the grace of our God into lewdness, but this doesn't mean that there is anything wrong or dangerous about the message of God's grace. It simply shows how corrupt the human heart is. And these certain men deny the Lord Jesus Christ. They do this by refusing to recognize who Jesus said he was, and therefore they also deny who God the Father is also. We are not told specifically how these men denied the only Lord God. It may be that they denied him with their ungodly living, or that it may be that they denied him with their heretical doctrines. Probably both are true. Verse 5, But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. So Jude knew he wasn't telling them anything new. They were already taught this example. But they needed to hear it again and to apply it to their present situation. Ideally, every Christian would read these allusions to the Old Testament and say, Yes, Jude, I know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, If we don't know what Jude wrote about, it shows that we need to deepen our understanding of the Bible. And so Jude's going to remind us of what happened in Numbers 14. God delivered the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. They went out of Egypt and without unintended delays came to a place called Kadesh Barnea on the threshold of the promised land. But at Kadesh Barnea, the people refused to trust God and go into the promised land of Canaan. Therefore, almost none of the adult generation who left Egypt entered into the promised land. And you can think of what God did for the people of Israel in this situation and how, and then how they responded to him. They experienced God's miraculous deliverance at the Red Sea. They heard the very voice of God at Mount Sinai. They received his daily care and provision of manna in the wilderness. Yet they still lapsed into unbelief and never entered into the place of blessing and rest that God had for them. 
And those who doubted and rejected God at Kadesh Barnea paid a bigger price than just not entering the promised land. They also received the judgment of God. Psalm 95 will describe how the Lord reacted to them. For 40 years I was grieved with that generation and said, It is the people who go astray in their hearts, and they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Psalm 95 verse 10 11. And so the warning through Jude is clear. The people of Israel started out of Egypt well enough. They had many blessings from God along the way, but they did not endure to the end because they did not believe God's promise of power and protection. And this example is going to give us two lessons. First, it assures us that certain men causing trouble will certainly be judged, even though they may have started out well in their walk with God. Jude says the certain men might have started out well, but so did the children of Israel. And God afterward destroyed those who did not believe. Secondly, it's going to warn us that we also must follow Jesus to the end and never be among those who did not believe. So the final test of our Christianity is endurance. Some start the race, but they never finish it. Verse 6, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So Jude's letter is famous for bringing up obscure and controversial points, and this is one of them. Jude is speaking of the angels who sinned, who are now imprisoned and awaiting the future day of judgment. And so there is some measure of controversy about the identity of these particular angels. We only have two places in the Bible where it speaks of angels sinning. First, there was the original rebellion of some angels against God in Isaiah 14, verse 12 through 14, where it says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how you're cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. And you get those five I will statements. And then Revelation 12, verse 4, His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Secondly, there was the sin of the sons of God that's described in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. And so you'll remember our study in the book of Genesis. I cover this in great detail, and this is that connection. So Genesis 6, verses 1 and 2 is a controversial passage all in its own. Uh, but I think Scripture very plainly lays it all out here for us. So let's go through it. Genesis 6, verses 1 and 2 will say, Now it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God, angels, saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. All right, so there is a significant debate as to if the sons of God are angelic beings or just another way of saying the followers of God among humans, the, the Seth view, like it came from the Sethite line, which just doesn't match up with Scripture. But Jude's going to help us answer this question, right? So, did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode. So this offense was connected with some kind of sexual sin, and such as the sexual union between the rebellious angelic beings, the sons of God in Genesis 6-2, and the human beings, the daughters of men in Genesis 6-2, we know that there was some sexual aspect to this sin because Jude tells us in the following verse in 7, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, so the words in a similar manner to these refers back to the angels of Jude 6. And the words gone after strange flesh refers to their unnatural sexual union. We know some things about this unnatural sexual union from Genesis chapter 6. So does David. We know that this unnatural union produced unnatural offspring. This uh, unnatural union corrupted the genetic pool of mankind. So God had to find Noah... A man perfect in his generations. His bloodline wasn't messed up yet, right? That is, he was pure in his genetics. That's Genesis 6 verse 9. And this unnatural union prompted an, an incredibly drastic judgment of God. A global flood wiping out all of mankind except for eight people. And we can add another piece of knowledge from Jude 6. This unnatural union prompted God to uniquely imprison the angels who sinned in this way because they're reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. As for the specific details of this unnatural union, it is useless to speculate. We don't know how fallen angel genetic material could mix with human genetic material. Uh, perhaps it happened through a unique form of demon possession and a fallen angel worked through a human host. 
We know that angels have the ability to assume human uh, appearance, at least temporarily, but we don't know much more than that. We do know that the Nephilim came out of that, though, the giants. And so God judged these wicked angels, setting them in everlasting chains. And apparently some fallen angels are in bondage, while others are unbound and active among mankind as demons. So by not keeping their proper place, they're now kept in chains. Their sinful pursuit of freedom put them in bondage. In the same way, those who insist on the freedom to do whatever they want are like these angels, bound with everlasting chains. True freedom is going to come from obedience to God. And so if angels cannot break the chains sin brought upon them, then we are foolish to think that humans can break them. We can't even set ourselves free from these chains. But we can be set we can only be set free by Jesus Christ. And this reminds us that these angels who sinned with an unnatural sexual union are no longer active. With his radical judgment back in the days of Noah, God put an end to this kind of unnatural sexual union. And this example gives us two lessons. First, it assures us that these certain men causing trouble will be judged, no matter what their spiritual status has been. And these angels at one time stood in the immediate glorious presence of God, and now they're in everlasting chains. So if God judged the angels who sinned, he will judge these certain men. So secondly, it's going to warn us that we also must continue walking with Jesus. If the past spiritual experience of these angels, who had direct access to God didn't guarantee their future spiritual state, then neither does ours. We must keep walking and be on guard. And I will note, in Matthew 24, verse 37, Jesus says, But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. And when you look at what happened in the days of Noah with the Nephilim and the angels that left their first estate, if I look at Scripture then I would say that probably after the rapture, taking a pre-trib look, that things may get really weird after that. Because God's going to send them the delusion. And Jesus says, as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So I imagine that period after the rapture, but before the second coming of Christ, things are going to be weird. And we know in Revelation that he opens up the pit and all sorts of demons come out onto the world and we're going to get to that when we get to revelation but for now let's continue to verse 7 as sodom and gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh are set forth as an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire so these two cities and the cities around them also stand as examples of god's judgment their sin which was most conspicuously homosexuality, but it included a wide variety of other sins as well, brought forth God's judgment. And so Sodom and Gomorrah were blessed, privileged places. They were situated in a blessed area. It was well watered everywhere, like the Garden of the Lord, in Genesis 13, verse 10. Right, they had a lot of money there. And so Jude's going to refer to the account in Genesis 19, where the homosexual conduct of the men of Sodom is described. Ezekiel 16, verse 49 will tell us of the other sins of Sodom. Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. All right, sounds a lot like our culture today. And so sexual depravity was not only uh, their only sin, but it was certainly among their sins, and Jude's going to make this plain. And so the sins described in Ezekiel 16, verse 49, show that Sodom and Gomorrah were indeed prosperous. They were blessed areas. You don't have the fullness of food, the abundance of idleness, if you don't have material blessings. But despite their great blessing from God and material prosperity, they sinned and they were judged. In Genesis 19, Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed with fire from heaven. But that wasn't the end of their judgment by fire. Far worse than what happened in Genesis 19, they suffered the vengeance of eternal fire. This example is going to give us two, re two lessons here. First, it's going to assure us that certain men causing trouble will be judged, no matter how much they have been blessed in the past. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah were once wonderfully blessed, but eventually suffered the vengeance of eternal fire, so will it be with these certain men. Secondly, it's going to warn us that we also must continue walking with Jesus. If the blessings of the past didn't guarantee their future spiritual state, then neither does ours. Verse 8, Likewise also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. 
So Jude connected the certain men with the people of Sodom and Gomorrah and their sensuality, defile the flesh, and their rejection of God's authority, right, reject authority. And so when Jude pointed out that these certain men reject authority, it meant that they wanted to be in authority. Therefore, they rejected the authority of God, and they rejected those God put in authority. Today, our culture encourages us to reject authority and to recognize the self as the only real authority in our lives. And we can do this with the Bible by choosing to only believe certain passages, cherry-picking, if you will. We can do it with our beliefs by choosing at the salad bar of religion. Or we can do it with our lifestyle by making our own rules and not recognizing the proper authorities that God has established. And we will suffer the consequences for that. And so in the, and most people do. In the darkest days of Israel, society was characterized by a term, every man did what was right in his own eyes. In Judges 21 verse 25, that was not a positive statement. Things were pretty dark then. Today, this is the pattern of all the world and especially Western civilization. And we are suffering for it plainly. So it is possible that Jude meant that the certain men were out of touch with reality. It's more likely that he meant that they claimed to have the prophetic dreams, which were really deceptions. And probably these dignitaries were the apostles or other leaders in the church. Their rejection of authority was connected with their speaking evil of dignitaries. Verse 9. Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. And so Jude mentioned two kinds of angelic beings. Michael is among the angelic beings that's faithful to God, who are the servants of God and man. The devil is among the angelic beings rebelling against God, who are the enemies of man and God. And so... <clears throat> There are invisible angelic beings all around us. There are ministering spirits sent by God to assist us, and demonic spirits who want to defeat us. So the devil can't unsave a saved person, but through his deceptions, he can corrupt and defile a Christian who is supposed to walk in purity and freedom. To the devil, we are time bombs, ready to wreck his work. Bombs that he'd like to defuse and make ineffective. And uh, many people today don't believe the devil exists, but the Bible clearly says he does. Or, you know, if they believe he exists, they think of him in funny images from the Middle Ages. Back then, the miracle plays were a chief form of entertainment. And it was, it was sort of a pageant where religious stories were acted out on a stage. And the audience learned to look for one character that was always dressed in red. He wore horns on his head and had a tail dangling behind him. His shoes were like cloven hoofs and he had a pitchfork in his hand. And the audience was amused by this silly characterization of Satan and got the idea that he's some sort of a comical character. And the devil doesn't mind being thought of this way at all. And so Michael the archangel, this angelic being, is mentioned by name in four passages of the Bible in Daniel 10, Daniel 12, and Revelation 12, and here in Jude. Every time Michael appears, it is in the context of battle or readiness to fight. He is an archangel, which simply means a leading angel. If the devil has an opposite, it certainly is not God. It is Michael the archangel, another high-ranking angelic being. And so let it be observed that the word archangel, archangel is never found in the plural number in the sacred writings. There can be properly only one archangel, one chief or head of all the angelic host. Nor is the word devil, as applied to the great enemy of mankind, ever found in the plural. There can be one monarch of all the fallen spirits. And so, this is another obscure reference by Jude when he disputed about the body of Moses. The last we read about the body of Moses is in Deuteronomy 34, verses 5 and 6. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, opposite Beth Peor. But no one knows the grave to this day. So we don't know where Jude received his information about this dispute. He might have received a unique revelation from God. But according to teachers in the early church, Jude referred to an apocryphal book known as the Assumption of Moses, of which only small portions survive. And we don't even exactly know why there was a dispute about the body of Moses. I'm going to give you my viewpoint here in a second. Uh, some have said that the devil wanted to use Moses' body as an object of worship to lead Israel astray into idolatry. Others have thought that Satan wanted to desecrate the body of Moses and claimed a right to it because Moses had murdered an Egyptian. Um, 
Yet others will say it's more likely that the devil anticipated a purpose God had for Moses' body, and the devil tried to defeat that plan. And we know that after his death, Moses appeared in bodily form at the transfiguration in Matthew 17 with Elijah, whose body was caught up into heaven in 2 Kings 2. Perhaps also Moses and Elijah are the two witnesses of Revelation chapter 11, and God needed Moses' body for that future plan. But for Jude... um, The main point isn't why Michael was disputed, but how he disputed with the devil. And here's here's my viewpoint on it. The word for body is soma in the Greek. And what's interesting is that when you look up the body of Moses, the soma of Moses, or the body of Christ, when you speak about the body of Christ, you're talking about the church body, group of believers that fall into the church. Michael is always seen fighting on behalf of Israel. Always. He's always appearing as a warrior in Daniel 10, Daniel 12, Revelation 12, as well as here in Jude, always on behalf of Israel. He's always he's even referred to as Israel's prince. And so what I think is happening here is that Michael is fighting on behalf of Israel. The body of Moses, the body of people of Moses, Moses gave the law to Israel. Whereas the body of Christ is to the church. And so here, if we look, read through it again, yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, Israel, he dared not to bring a, against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. And so that's what I think personally is happening. It doesn't make any sense to me personally why they would make Moses' body and, and uh, idol worship, because it would just be dirt. And if Satan wanted to, he, he would make an idol out of Moses' body anyway. And he certainly did that from the warped view of Judaism by the time it got to the Pharisees. I think it fits perfectly into Scripture when we see the body of Moses as Israel, who Satan is always trying to crush throughout the Old Testament. And Michael's always fighting on behalf of Israel. And I think that's what Jude is referring to here. And so the manner, continuing on, the manner of Michael's fight is a model for spiritual warfare. First, we see that Michael was in a battle. Secondly, we see that he battled in the Lord's authority. And this is going to prove to us that Michael is not Jesus. As some heretical groups have thought, Jesus rebuked the devil in his own authority, but Michael did not. Michael used Jesus' authority. And so Michael did not mock or accuse the devil. Be, you know, as a lot of people do today, God hasn't called us to judge the devil, to condemn the devil, or to mock him or accuse him, as I see a lot of pastors do today, but to battle against him in the name of the Lord. Let the Lord do it. The Lord rebuke him. And this is going to relate to the certain men by a how much more line of thinking. If Michael dared not bring against him a reviling accusation against the devil, then how much more should these certain men not speak evil of dignitaries? Verse 10, But these speak evil of whatever they do not know, and whatever they know naturally, like brute beast, and these things they corrupt themselves. So in contrast to Michael, who would not even speak evil of the devil, these certain men spoke evil, especially when they rejected authority and spoke against dignitaries. The certain men didn't even know how the things or the people they spoke evil about. Their evil speech was made worse by their ignorance. And since they also spoke against dignitaries and rejected authority, these certain men did not know about true spiritual leadership and authority, so they found it easy to speak evil against it. And these certain men pretended to be spiritual, but their only knowledge was uh, really natural. Even what they knew naturally, they still used to corrupt themselves with an unspiritual mind. So brute beasts can be smart or clever in an instinctive way, but they obviously do not have spiritual knowledge. And this, it was the same way with these spiritual or these certain men. Verse 11, Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. So Cain's story is found in Genesis 4. Each of the sons of Adam and Eve brought an offering to the Lord, and Cain, being a farmer, brought an offering from his harvest. Abel, being a shepherd, brought an offering from his flocks. God accepted, Abel, uh, God accepted Abel's offering, but he rejected Cain's sacrifice. And many people assume that because Abel brought a blood sacrifice and Cain brought a grain sacrifice, that the difference between the two offerings was sacrificial blood. But the real difference was between faith and unbelief. Hebrews 11 verse 4 will make this very plain. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead still speaks. 
So Cain's sacrifice was probably more pleasing to the sense than the carcass of a dead lamb, but his sacrifice was offered without faith, and therefore it was unacceptable to God. You can give to God whatever you have or whatever you are, but you must offer it in faith. And so Genesis 4 verse 5 will say that after God rejected his sacrifice, Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. He became angry because he knew he was rejected by God. So in a fit of anger, Cain murdered Abel, and then he lied about it to God. And 1 John 3 verse 12 will tell us that Cain murdered his brother because Abel's works were righteous by faith, while Cain's own were wicked. Cain's lack was not in his works, but in faith. And Jude says that Cain typifies a way that certain men follow in. It's the way of unbelief and empty religion, which leads to jealousy, persecution of the truly godly, and eventually to murderous anger. And there is no greater curse on the earth than empty, vain religion. Those who have a form of godliness but deny its power in Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. So no wonder Paul added, and from such people turn away. So many Christians are afraid of secular humanism or atheism or the world. But dead religion is far more dangerous and sends more people to hell than anything else. These certain men were in the way of Cain, which is the way of a dead religion. Verse 11. Have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit. All right people that use religion for profit so Balaam's story is in Numbers 22 to 25 in chapter 31 during the time of the Exodus Israel advanced to the land of Moab after defeating the Amorites when the Israelites came near King Balak of Moab sought the help of a prophet named Balaam and so the first delegation from King Balak arrived and God told Balaam to have nothing to do with them God's initial words with Balaam were, You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. In Numbers 22, verse 12. And after the first visit, another more prestigious delegation came with great riches. Balaam wanted to go with them, and God allowed him to go. And Balaam lusted after the riches and prestige offered to him, and God gave him over to his own sin. And God warned Balaam to turn back. When he was on his way back to see Balak, yet his heart was so set on the rich reward that King Balak promised, and he continued on. Balaam even ignored a talking, uh, a talking donkey sent to warn him to turn back, which is a humorous scene. And Balaam knew that he did wrong. In Numbers 22, verse 34, he said to God, I have sinned. Now, therefore, if it displeases you, I will turn back. But he didn't turn back. He continued on, refusing to see that when God says no, then we must take it as a no. Instead, God gave Balaam what his sinful heart desired. And so, after meeting with King Balak of Moab, Balaam prophesied over Israel four times. But as he spoke forth God's word, he did not curse Israel. Instead, he blessed her each time. And when he was unsuccessful in cursing Israel, Balaam advised Balak on how to bring Israel under a curse. So instead of trying to have a prophet curse Israel, he should lead her into fornication and idolatry, and then God would curse a disobedient Israel. And Balak did just that, sending his young women into the camp of Israel to lead Israel into sexual immorality and idolatry. And so because of the people's sin, then God did curse Israel. He brought a plague of judgment upon Israel that killed 24,000 people. Therefore, Balaam was guilty of the greatest of sins, deliberately leading others into sin. Worse yet, he did it for money. And the greedy error of Balaam was that he was willing to compromise everything for money. The certain men Jude warned about had the same heart. And many Christians would never deny Jesus under persecution, but might deny him if they're offered a large sum of money. And there is not a single sin that corrupt man will not commit for the sake of money. Covetousness is such a dangerous sin that it killed Jesus. 30 pieces of silver helped put Jesus on that cross. So have run greedily is literally they were poured out. This is a strong picture of excessive indulgence. But Paul also uses the same term for the extravagant way that God loves us in Romans 5.5. 5, the love of God has been poured out in our hearts. Verse 11 and perished in the rebellion of Korah. So Korah's story is found in number 16. He was a prominent man in Israel. And one day he came to Moses saying, You take too much upon yourself, for all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourself about the congregation of the Lord? In number 16, verse 3. So Korah and his followers resented the authority that God gave to Moses and Aaron. They wanted some of it too. And so when Korah said this, Moses fell on his face, knowing that God's judgment was soon going to come. And Moses then proposed a test. 
Each group took censers for burning incense and came before the Lord. The Lord himself would choose which man he wanted to represent him, Moses or Korah. <laughs> and when they both came before God, the Lord told Moses to step away. Then the ground opened up and swallowed Korah and all of his followers. And after that, fire came down from heaven and burned up all of his supporters. They all perished. And so Korah was a Levite, but not of the priestly family of Aaron. So as a Levite, he had his own God-appointed sphere of ministry, yet he was not happy with that. He wasn't content with it. He wanted the ministry and the authority of Moses. So Korah needed to learn this essential lesson. We should work hard to fulfill everything God has called us to be. At the same time, we should never try to be what God has not called us to be. And so the rebellion of Korah, this was also a rejection of God's appointed leaders, especially God's appointed mediator. When the certain men rejected authority and spoke evil against dignitaries, they walked in the rebellion of Korah. So the rebellion of Korah lies in the broader area of a contemptuous and determined assertion of self against divinely appointed ordinances. And these three men came from quite different backgrounds. Cain was a farmer, Balaam was a prophet, and Korah was a leader of, in Israel. Apostasy is never confined to just one group of people. There are apostates in the pulpit, in the palace, and in the poorhouse. Verse 12 and 13. These are spots in your love feast. While they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves, they are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. So the early Christians often met for a common meal, something like a potluck dinner, and they called these meals love feasts or agape feasts. Uh, so when these certain men came, they were serving only themselves. They ate greedily at the love feast while others went hungry. So at this agape feast, everyone brought what they could, some a little, some a lot, but they all shared it together. Now for some slaves who were Christians, it might have been the only decent meal they regularly ate. And the selfishness of these certain men spoiled that fellowship. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17 through 34 is going to describe a similar problem in the Corinthian church. It always spoils fellowship when we come to a church with a selfish, bless me attitude. Many who would never eat selfishly at a church meal still come to church concerned with serving only themselves. And so spot. Some Greek scholars think this word should be translated hidden rocks instead of spots. One way or another, it doesn't make much real difference to the meaning of the passage. And literally in the ancient Greek, this is shepherding themselves. They were serving only themselves. They were shepherds of a sort, but only themselves. And so clouds without water are good for nothing. They bring no life-giving rain and they only block out the sun. They just exist for themselves. So these certain men were like these clouds. And so late autumn trees should have fruit, but these certain men did not bear fruit even when they should. They were like trees that only take instead of give. And so for modern man, the sea is often a thing of beauty. But to ancient man, especially in the biblical cultures, the sea was an unmanageable terror. And so Isaiah 57 verse 20 is going to express this idea where it says, But the wicked are like the troubled sea, when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. These certain men were busy and active like the raging waves of the sea, but all it brought was foaming up their own shame. And so... Busyness is no mark of correctness. The fruit of these men was like the, f the foam or scum of the seashore. Jude has in mind the ugly shoreline after a storm has washed up all sorts of driftwood, seaweed, and debris. And so wandering stars like comets shrieking through the sky, these certain men astonished the world for a time, and then they vanished into darkness. An unpredictable star was no good for guidance and navigation, even so these deceivers were useless and untrustworthy. And uh, the blackness of darkness forever is going to describe their destiny. Unless they repent, they would end up in hell and be there forever. And so the punishment of hell is forever because a mere man is paying for his own sins, offering an imperfect sacrifice, which must be repeated over and over again for eternity. And so a perfect man can offer a single sacrifice, but an imperfect man must continually offer that sacrifice. And our obligations to God are infinite, 
and can therefore only be satisfied in Jesus, an infinite person. Verse 14 and 15. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. That's five ungodlies. And so... Now Enoch. And so Jude is quoting um, Enoch, who is described in Genesis chapter 5 and mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. The ancient book of Enoch is not received as scripture, but it was highly respected among both the Jews and early Christians. And so Jude did not quote from Enoch to tell us anything new, but to give us a vivid description of what the Bible already teaches. The Apostle Paul also quoted non-biblical sources on at least three different occasions in Acts 17 verse 28. For in him we live and move to have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, Do not be deceived, evil company corrupts good habits. In Titus chapter 1, verse 12, one of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. So this wasn't to proclaim a new truth, but it was to support an already established biblical principle. So Jude's quoting from the book of Enoch doesn't mean that the whole book of Enoch is inspired scripture. Only the portion that Jude's quoting. And so, in the same way, when Paul quoted a pagan poet, he didn't mean that the entire work of that poet was inspired by God. Okay? And so, let's just let the word of God say what the word of God says. And so, in this quotation from the book of Enoch... Jude emphasized the words all and ungodly. God is coming to judge all of the ungodly. So many people take the judgment of God lightly, but the most important question in the world is, will God judge me? Am I accountable to him? If we are truly accountable to God, we are fools if we do not prepare to face that judgment. Verse 16 through 18. These are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts, and they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. And so Jude noticed that their methods all revolved around words. On top of their questionable lives, they were essentially a people of deception, departing from the foundation of Jesus Christ and the apostles and prophets. And these people were complainers. It has been rightly been observed that whenever a man gets out of touch with God, he likely begins complaining about something. And so these certain men knew how to use smooth, flattering words to get an advantage over other people. They would say anything, good or bad, to get that advantage. We are to be different. We are to remember that what Jesus said and the apostles said, which were spoken by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, the word of God is always the answer to dangers in or out of the church. And the apostles had warned that these things would happen, and even more so as the day approaches. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, we'll say, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. So perhaps Jude had in mind those who mocked the idea of Jesus' return, or he may mean the kind of men who mock those who don't go along the same path of destruction they travel on. And those who live according to their own ungodly lust love to mock those who want to please God. Jude wants Christians to expect this kind of mocking so they won't be surprised by it. Verse 19, these are sensual persons who cause divisions not having the spirit. So essentially, these men were not spiritual. They were carnal and insensitive to the Holy Spirit. Sensual in this context has nothing to do with sexual attractiveness. It describes a person who lives only by and for what he can get through his physical senses, and he lives this way selfishly. His motto is, if it feels good, do it. Or how can it be wrong if it feels so right? And who causes divisions? These certain men had an instinct to separate themselves and make divisions. The word found only once in the Bible denotes those superior people who keep themselves to themselves. Christian Pharisees, so to speak. And this same description, not having the Spirit, could be written over many churches or church projects or evangelism campaigns or home groups or even the individual Christian lives. The church and the world truly need genuinely spiritual men and women today. All right, verse 20 and 21. But you, beloved, building yourselves up 
on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. So we know that God loves even the ungodly in Romans 5 verse 6, where it says, For when we were still sinners without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. So, therefore, Jude doesn't mean live in such a way to make yourself lovable to God. Instead, keep yourselves in the love of God means to keep yourself in harmony with God's ever-present love. And so, we should understand what it means when the Bible says that God loves the ungodly. The significance of the idea that God loves us all has been twisted considerably. Consider the sinner who defends his sinful practice by saying, God just loves me the way I am. His implication is that God loves me, I must be pretty good. Actually, the fact that God loves him is a reflection on God's goodness, not his own. The perspective isn't, I'm so great that even God loves me, but God is so great that he loves even me. And so, God's love extends everywhere and nothing can separate us from it, but we can deny ourselves the benefits of God's love. People who don't keep themselves in the love of God will end up living as if they're on the dark side of the moon. The sun is always out there, always shining, but they're never in a position to receive its light or warmth. An example of this is the prodigal son of Luke 15, who was always loved by the father, but for a time he did not benefit from it. And so, <clears throat> building yourselves up on your most holy faith. And so, this is one way that we can keep ourselves in the love of God. It means to keep growing spiritually and to keep building up. Jude tells us, build yourselves up on your most holy faith. This means that we are responsible for our own spiritual growth. It's not good it's not good to just have one meal a week, all right? <clears throat> it means that we cannot wait for spiritual growth to just happen or expect others to make us grow. And Jude's already shown us the frailty of men and how deceivers even infiltrated the church. So if you entrust your spiritual growth to somebody else, it will not only hurt your spiritual growth, it may lead you astray. And so others can help provide an environment conductive for spiritual growth, but no one can make another person grow in his relationship with the Lord. It's an individual responsibility. And so the most holy faith is the same as the faith once for all delivered to all the saints in Jude 3. And Jude wasn't talking about growing in the most holy faith, though that is a valid idea. Jude is talking about growing on your most holy faith. We grow on the foundation of the truth. And so praying in the Holy Spirit is another way to keep ourselves in the love of God. The battle against wrong living and wrong teaching is a spiritual battle requiring prayer in the Holy Spirit. Uh, many of our prayers are directed by our own needs, by our own intellects, and by our own wishes and desires, but there is a higher level of prayer. Romans 8 verse 26, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray as for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us. So the Holy Spirit may help us pray by giving us the right words to say when we pray. He may speak through groanings which cannot be uttered in Romans 8 26. Or he might do it through the gift of tongues, a gift that God gives to seeking hearts, which wants to communicate with him on a deeper level than just normal conversation. And so, looking for the mercy of Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And this is the third way that we keep ourselves in the love of God. As we keep the blessed hope of Jesus soon return alive in our hearts, this effectively keeps us in the love of God and helps us to not give away our faith. Verse 22 and 23. And on some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. So Jude begins here to tell us what we must do with those who have been influenced by these certain men. We need to make a distinction based on where they are coming from. Certainly on some have compassion. So using wisdom, we approach different people in different manners. By being sensitive to the Holy Spirit, we can know when we should comfort and when we should rebuke. Christians should not abandon a friend uh, flirting with false teaching. They should help him through it in love. It means that we continue to love them, no matter how bad the person is or how misleading and terrible their doctrine is. We're not allowed to hate them or be unconcerned for their salvation. All right, A lot of times when people go after bad doctrines or crazy beliefs, it's because they're ignorant of the truth. I'm one to believe that once you see the truth, you can't really unsee it. And so compassion often means someone watching over someone, helping them with accountability. <clears throat> so meantime, you know, watch over others as well as yourselves and give them such help as their various needs require. And so others save with fear. This second group must be confronted more strongly, but in fear, not in a sanctimonious superiority. You may need to pull them out of the fire, but never do it in pride. 
verse 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. So Jude's going to close this letter with a famous doxology, a brief declaration of praise to God. And so Jude's doxology reminds us of God's care and of our destiny. And Jude's message of warning and doom might have depressed and discouraged his readers. Perhaps the original readers thought that uh, with so much false teaching and immorality around, very few Christians would ever reach heaven. Here he's going to remind them that the answer only lies in the power of God. He's able to keep you. You're not even able to keep yourself. In the mountain climbing, the uh, beginning hiker attaches himself to the expert so that if he loses footing, he won't stumble and fall to his death. In the same manner, if we keep connected to God, we cannot fall. He keeps us safe. So by comparing passages of scripture, we also find out who is really responsible for our safekeeping. Jude began the letter by addressing those who are preserved in Jesus in verse 1. Then he exhorted Christians to avoid dangerous men and to keep themselves in the love of God, verse 21. Here at the end, he concluded with the recognition that it is ultimately God who keeps us from stumbling and falling. So Paul puts the same idea in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So keeping us spiritually safe is God's work, but you can always tell the people he is working in because they are working also. God doesn't call us to simply let the Christian life happen to us in a life of ease and comfort. And and he doesn't command us to save ourselves. He calls us to a partnership with him, a call to action. And so as God is faithful, we don't have to slink shamefacedly into the presence of God. We can be presented before him with exceeding joy. And this all is going to remind us of God's wisdom, glory, and power. Jude isn't trying to say that we can or should give these things to God. When we acknowledge and declare the truth about God, it glorifies him. We aren't giving God more majesty and power than he had before. We are just recognizing and declaring it. And this, uh, both now and forever, could be translated unto all the ages. It's as complete a statement of eternity as can be made in the human language. And so our victory, our triumph in God is forever. And there is serious deception in the world and often among those so-called Christians. There are enemies of the gospel who have infiltrated the church, yet... Despite the greatness of the threat, God is still greater. And he wins, and if we only will stay with him, we are guaranteed that victory also. So Jude is a book full of warning, but it closes with supreme confidence in God. Dangerous times should make us trust in a mighty God.